welcome to the 14th instalment of this exciting series of shows sponsored by Dublin City Comics and Collectibles where we, the full force, take an in-depth look at the old Action Force comics in no particular order. We are currently making our way through the first Action Force mini-comics in this special sub-series of shows and now we get to the fifth and final issue. I am Chris Space Case McLeod, aka Diagnostic 80, and joining me on this new episode, as always, is Brian Cosmic Perusa Hickey. <laughs> so let's get on with it, shall we? Mini explosion. Oh, Cosmic Perusa, I love it. <laughs> In space, no one can hear you scream. We rocket into the fifth and final mini comic with a Space Force adventure entitled. SPACE BATTLE! Originally published in 1983 and presented free with battle number 436. Credits include writer, uncredited, possibly Jerry Day. Artist, uncredited, possibly Rob Turner. Letterer, uncredited. And colours, uncredited. Cast in this galactic episode. <laughs> For Space Force we have Commander, Chuck Connors, codename Sky Raider. Space Patroller Greg Taggart, codename Blast Off. Pilot Yuri Ivanovich Asimov, codename Hot Jets. We Security Trooper Lars Elson, codename Hawkwind. Space Force Engineers, Action Force Team Leaders, and multiple troops. For the Red Shadows, we have Baron Ironblood, The Black Major, Red Shadow Troops and Red Vulture. And for vehicles, Space Force, break out the Action Force Space Station, the Cosmic Cruiser and the Satellite Defense. The Q4 Swordfish. Z Force, bring out the Battle Tank. And the Red Shadows have the Shuttlecraft and the Shadow Track. That Shuttlecraft. Wicked in it. I like that, I like that. Our story synopsis. In the first free mini-comic, Ironblood's Revenge, we saw the Red Shadows attack and successfully take over a Space Force satellite station, taking a number of hostages. We start this issue as that one finished, with Commander Connors and his men suspended in a zero-gravity room, watching on as Ironblood orchestrates his attacks on Action Force teams all over the world and threatening the remaining Space Force troops that they would be sent into space to die. I absolutely adore that opening panel because I, f I feel like it's almost like the aftermath of what the cover is showing it's like the cover of that of that issue on, no on number five it's like really cool and action and the cosmic cruisers flying around and the shuttlecraft shooting at the satellite defense and then you open it to that panel and it's effectively like the cosmic cruisers dead in this in the water even though they're in the water the uh the red shuttle shuttlecraft is docked and there are like floating dead like Space Force troops all over the floating around in space, aren't there? It's just a fantastic piece of artwork. There's real carnage here. It's pretty harrowing seeing these Space Force patrollers with their kind of jetpacks kind of smoking. They're just kind of floating there dead in space. You've got the Red Shadow shuttlecraft docked onto the space station. And inside the windows of the space station, it looks like scores of kind of red shadows looking at the windows at the dead space force troopers yeah like i almost it almost felt to me like they're running down the hallways coming off the shuttle do you know what i mean it feels like they're just filling up the space station and yeah you can you can definitely see some sort of attempt at making the red black and white of these of the red shadow troops in those windows can't you absolutely um and i just love rob turner's very kind of retro style for the, you know, for the the space station and the, yeah. the red shadow shuttlecraft it has that almost kind of flash gordon-esque kind of feel to it it reminds me of dan dare you know we mentioned ian kennedy on the last episode I, yes. I i feel like it's got that not even just in the faces but just in the yeah that styling of like it's it's almost like what they thought the future would look like at that time period and i, I just yeah it's got a real kind of very uniformed aesthetic across all the kind of sci-fi kind of stories of the time the red shadows as well like i mean obviously they've attacked space force here in order to take out the communications so that action force can't really orchestrate their missions all over the world and it was proving effective but action force have managed to obviously thwart each attack despite losing a lot of their troops at the same time but obviously their hierarchy has remained intact so you've still got um, even though Space Force have still got their story to kind of tell, SAS have kind of come out of it, Eagle's still alive, and Skip has still come out, has come out the other side with uh, Wheels, 
and Quarrel. And you've also got Q Force. So yeah, obviously yeah. Leviathan has kind of managed to escape with his life as well. So the hierarchy is still intact and therefore Action Force is has probably done better than you'd expect them to do in, in this situation. Yeah, I mean I think the Red Shadows got a lucky break taking over the space station. I mean that the, the Space Force guys were caught completely off guard. Yeah. They thought it was the regular supply run coming up, but they didn't have similar luck with the the other factions they were just maybe a little bit more well i was going to say they're a little bit more prepared but perhaps the shadows were just a bit sloppier with their uh with their attacks on the other factions yeah big time as space force begin to realize their fate they notice a group of red shadows looting the ship and taking personal items from the men a plan is hatched when one of the red shadows drops blast off's boomerang <laughs> Sorry, they're getting all the stereotypes in here, aren't they? You've got Connor's cowboy hat in there, and you've got Taggart's boomerang, and it's just it's just kind of funny how far they go to uh, stretch those stereotypes back then. We've even got a flute in there. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Well, it would have been funnier if they'd pulled a didgeridoo out, I think. But um, yeah, we got, we got away with that one. As the Space Force team are being escorted to the airlock they spring into action once they get close to the boomerang. <laughs> Blast off, picks it up, and throws it towards the control panel, taking out the computer. A little bit far-fetched here, and obviously that boomerang has done some damage, considering, you know... I mean, have you ever thrown a boomerang? Because they can be pretty dangerous, obviously, uh, when they come whipping back to you. But I still don't think it would do that much damage, if it hits something. I've I've never tried actually I've never successfully thrown a boomerang and have it come back to me. But I have seen actual boomerangs. I mean, they're pretty lethal. Yeah. And if you knew what you were doing with one, you could cause a lot of damage. But could you make your computer panel blow up? That's what I'm <laughs> saying here. It seems like a li- a bit of a stretch on this one, but uh it's fun nonetheless. Well I love how he shouts out okay boomer as he fires that <laughs> boomerang. <laughs> I know, that's quite current and topical, actually. That's brilliant. Uh, there must be a bunch oh. of millennials. Uh, the Space Force are all millennials. That's why. That's, what, that's what's happened there. The other Space Force troops subdue the remaining Red Shadows, and Hawkwind and Hot Jets seal the door, trapping the last of the enemy in the airlock. When we spoke in the last on the last episode and a few and it kind of it kind of relates to a lot of the episodes we do here. When you're when you're dealing with numerous troops who all look the same you really are reliant on like constantly name checking certain characters what they do well here actually is they've they've managed to have you know different hair color thrown in there they've they've got uh, you know like the, the the way they talk obviously one like um Taggart's Australian so they can kind of play up to that so there's that that element of trying to do as much as they possibly can to identify the characters that you're looking at because you know it's difficult when they're all wearing the same stuff isn't it you can see the team have kind of worked together in this the writer and the artist so none of these characters actually resemble their action figure except for chuck connors yeah so they've put all of these guys in a uniform that you would typically wear if you were you know not on active duty when you're while yeah. you're on board a yeah. you know a space station so they're all in that kind of similar sort of uniform garb that connors wears and it makes total sense. I mean, we've, we've kind of laughed and joked before about, you know, Larry Hama having Torpedo walking around in his flippers. <laughs> it wouldn't make sense to have these guys kitted up in spacesuits and just walking around inside the interior of, yeah, the, of yeah. the space station. They've cracked that nut, but then the rider has to work a little bit harder to make sure that we can identify who these guys are. And they, they pull it off really well. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, hurry Hawkwind, seal the inner hatchway. So, you know, it's... You know, you're dealing with Space Force's Russian and Swedish members, so you know it's the Russian and the Swede, so you know it's Hawkwind, and you know it's Hot Jets, so you know it's Hot, hot jets. jets, you know it's Hot Jets, and you know it's Hawkwind. Even though the computer has been taken out by Blastoff, one of the last dying Red Shadows activates the airlock, sacrificing his own fellow troops to create a weak spot for the Red Shadow shuttle craft to attack. I think that our, our Space Force guys here made light work of these red shadows like yeah we saw in the opening panel scores of these red shadows pouring out shuttlecraft 
And, um, you know, our, our, our four dudes have kind of very swiftly dispatched these guys with a boomerang and a, and, and a you know, shove them in the airlock move. <laughs> <laughs> it has, it was, it was quick, wasn't it? It was very, they were very quick to over, get the best, the better of their kind of captors there. I mean, look, real estate is limited. They, they've got to tell like a super fast, you know, or, or tell a big story like in super fast time, you know, without kind of cramming hundreds and hundreds of panels into like, you know, eight pages. Yeah, yeah. But the other side, again, a pretty savage move by oh. the, the, the Red Shadow, the dying Red Shadow, kind of sacrificing his troops in the airlock i wonder i wonder if he was doing that not with an not with an idea to create a weak spot to to attack but he thought by opening the airlock they'd all get sucked out and die do you know what i mean like i I feel like that's what that would have been what his i mean otherwise i mean that's a very complex thought process to be like well if i open the airlock there's airlock there's a weak spot for them to attack yes i mean it's it's almost more like the weak spot was just a coincidence for yeah, the yeah for the shuttlecraft to kind of open fire on it but yeah i mean it's blood for the baron you know he that's what he shouts as he kind of jumps on the control panel maybe he is trying to just suck everybody out off. of the all oh, right out, yeah. out of the ship you know not suck everyone off <laughs> <laughs> well he does actually choke, doesn't he? Blood for the Baron <laughs> choke. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, dear. Before the shuttlecraft can open fire, Sky Raider manages to find his hat and reach a gun to us to take out the Red Shadow ship and prevent Baron Ironblood from getting hold of any top secret info. I think that's brilliant that he's wearing his, like, kind of cowboy hat on that, on that panel. I think it's just brilliant. Because <laughs> oh, at first dear. I was thinking... I was thinking, oh, he's just probably just wearing his the, the other hat. But no, he's literally wearing his cowboy hat at that point. So in that manoeuvre of getting the best of better of their captors, uh, turning the tide or whatever, they've also managed to re- get back a boomerang and, and his hat in that time, which is just absolutely brilliant. So their personal stuff is back in their, their possession. I mean, it, <laughs> one thing I will say, though, he refers to himself as a Texan man, but he was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. I know. And in this comic, his file card's included in the comic. And it says nothing about Texas on the file card. Weird. Very <laughs> weird. And that gun turret has some serious Star Wars vibes, doesn't it? It's like the uh, lasers on board the Death Star. Yeah. yeah. Guns of the Death Star. That's exactly from straight out of the Kenner Death Star playset. That's exactly what they look like. Yeah. And, and again, that would have been probably easily accessible at hand reference to, wouldn't it? So... Yeah, that would uh, that make sense that it would be so close to something like that. The story switches back to Ironblood's secret ground base as the Red Shadow troops report back to him regarding each of the mission's failures, including the jungle, desert and sea ops we saw in the previous issues. I love this. He's asking for a report in and every single report is like just a total disaster. Oh yeah, sorry mate, we uh, we f- that up, sorry. Yeah, it's what like, do do? what does he say? He says like, so let me have reports on all the other attacks. The China Sea, where the, we launched a ship-to-ship attack on Q-Force, the special nautical unit. Any reply from our pirates? Uh, no, master. We must presume them lost. <laughs> Failure, just like the desert attack on Z-Force and the jungle attack on the SAS. There will be another time, my lord. It's like, mate, <laughs> mate, you've lost all over the place. Oh, dear. So, And the, the realisation hits in. So Baron Ironblood is incensed and throws a grenade at the Black Major and the Red Shadow troops who delivered the bad news. One Shadow and the Black Major are quick enough to avoid the explosion and he congratulates them for surviving. Doesn't this just highlight how mental Iron Blood really is, and, and he's, really wasteful as well? On top of that, we've covered a few stories you know, where they they're recruiting Red Shadows, they're training Red Shadows, and they're they're murdering the Red Shadows in their in the hundreds. Yeah, I mean he, he is. I mean he is insane. There's no two ways about it. And we just see this insanity taken to a whole new level here when he tosses a grenade into his into his own troops. It's unreal and then like obviously because he throws that into the the group it doesn't kill all of them and then he kind of (laughs) goes he kind of says yes you two are fast though those shadows were glad to die for their master we will all be more clever and careful next time it's like what you absolute mental case you've just like killed a bunch of your men and you expect the two that were quick enough to get out the bloody way 
Uh, like, I mean, it's just it's, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, what's the word? A lot of trust going on there by Baron Ironblood that he's not you know he's not really thinking of or well, maybe I'm pissing these guys off a bit by trying to kill them every time they fail me. His his troops, I mean, are and we're not quite really sure how he does it, but they're all supposed to be brainwashed into yeah. being loyal to him. But clearly, the Black Major and Red Vulture haven't lost their their sense of self preservation. Yeah, yeah. But yet they still remain fiercely loyal to Ironblood despite his several attempts to kill them uh in his insanity yeah i think that's that's what separates them from just normal red shadows as well isn't it it's like the fact they've got that's something extra that kind of makes them like more of a i don't know more of an, a key component in the red shadows kind of hierarchy the issue concludes the following day at action force headquarters the team leaders and remaining troops are together for a debriefing where it is determined that they need to rebuild their forces as soon as possible and go on the offensive to eradicate baron ironblood and the red shadow threat once and for all boom i like that af logo in the background that is so pretty cool cool i like how the line in the a runs into the bottom horizontal line on the f so that it's horizontal really nice, runs, yeah. yeah that's really cool i'm gonna have to, i might try and recreate that because that's really neat because i don't think that is an actual licensed or official logo this is just rob turner you know, just trying to put some kind of branding you know to identify that you're yeah. in action force hq here and uh he, he's designed a, a pretty kick logo it's neat isn't it yeah i like that a lot very futuristic too so i mean obviously you know eagle skip sky raider leviathan all alive despite the assassination attempts on them but the fact they're all intact is kind of a testament to their individual skill sets, as I said before. And Red Shadows have failed to do what they wanted to do and, and eradicate Action Force. In actual fact, you've probably set up Action Force to be way more on the ball next time, haven't, haven't in, in that sense. Absolutely. So, like, I mean, they were caught, you know, off guard. They thought they had dealt with the Baron Ironblood and Red Shadow threat. They came back and you know, they, they, they struck hard at Action Force. But like you say, they're, the, the resolve of Action Force now, well, they're, they're, they're aware that this enemy is going to be a tougher enemy than they had originally thought. And they're resolved to make sure they, they do whatever it takes to bring him down. And that final panel where we just see these Action Force, you know, vehicles and infantry oh, yeah. just crashing up onto the beach and just engaging in battle with the Red Shadows. I mean, it's a fantastic uh, end panel here. Yeah, the swordfish in the battle tank look great there. Really cool. And the, the Red Shadows are drawn really well detail in loads of detail. You don't often get to see like a lot of the shape around the helmet. Wee! But like around the back of that one guy on the, the kind of bottom right hand corner of the panel. You can see loads of detail in the in the shape and the design of that helmet. It's really really cool. That's yeah. I mean, again, hats off to Rob Turner. Super job on, on the artwork here. And we have this, you know, it's almost like the D Day landings. The the, the 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 Action Force infantry look like you know U.S. Marines storming the beach with the the, the heavy artillery of the uh, swordfish and the battle tank coming up behind them. Yeah, and they've got those like they, even their helmets are quite reminiscent of the old style kind of military there isn't it so it's not it doesn't necessarily look like zed force does it no it's uh it's straight up world war ii um marines there yeah um i mean overall it was a really cool way to tie it all up get the ball rolling on this awesome universe starting and finishing with space force was a really good way of kind of bookending the story and helping to make it a cohesive arc and and even though the issue was short they squeezed a lot in and made it super fun at the same time i think i mean it's a solid lead into the battle action force saga isn't it yeah i mean i actually remember collecting these uh, as a kid and being really excited uh, and looking forward to the next mini comic coming out this onboarded me into the action force universe and and into the toys as a kid so it did its job really really well back in the day and you know and while it probably as, as we go through all the stories in, in battle action force we know that this kind of stronger stories with you know more character a little bit more to the actual stories themselves but this was a nice little kind of mini run to introduce us to the action force universe that was a great little job not one wilhelm scream in this issue <laughs> No. <laughs> really depressed me i was kind of looking everywhere i was like look there's probably a hidden one somewhere like you know no not a single ie a ie i should say anyway that's yeah we've come to the end of the mini comics brian again thank you for going through those with me and um we'll have to we'll, we'll what we'll do after this the next thing we have to do is get into one of those ridiculous stories that goes on for about 500 issues operation bloodhound that's a big <laughs> have, one isn't it that is a I've massive working one. At those show notes for a while <laughs> 
<laughs> it's, yeah, the six month of your six months of your life has gone into uh, building those show notes. But yeah, I mean that's a stonkingly long issue, isn't it? A stonkingly long story, I should say. Well, you know, it picks up really nicely straight after this. So, if, if if we were to kind of give a little preface to Operation Bloodhound, we see Action Force at the end here talking about their resolve to track down Iron Blood and just eradicate him. That's exactly where Operation Bloodhound picks up. Brilliant. Space Force are, have tracked Baron Iron Blood to a location in South America, and SAS Force are going in to recce the area ahead of a major offensive. So that's the setup. Disorder Battle Number Fifteen coming soon. It's going to be Operation Bloodhound <laughs> coming in six months' time. Uh, Brian, thanks again, mate, for jumping on and chatting Disorder of the Battle with me. It's been a a blast as always. I loved it. Thank you very much. That's it for our look at the mini-comics that started the Action Force lore. We hope you enjoyed this mini-series of Disorder of Battle. Thank you to my co-host Brian Hickey and to our sponsors Dublin City Comics and Collectibles. See you next time and as always, full Action Force. There's that Wilhelm scream. Thank you. Make sure you get involved with the discussion by liking, sharing and commenting on these videos and as always you can keep up with the show after listening by following on Twitter at The Full Force, liking the Facebook page facebook.com forward slash The Full Force and if you would like to contact the show you can message us on either of those platforms with feedback or questions. We have also started a Patreon page so if you want to see your name up in lights on these videos or enjoy exclusive bonus content then check out patreon.com forward slash the full force podcast or click the link on any of the posts this podcast appears in full force and a big shout out to our sponsors dublin city comics and collectibles located at 46 bolton street inns key dublin one ireland you can visit their website at dublincitycomics.ie and on facebook at facebook.com forward slash dublin city comics